talk, I, I've been asked to talk about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan. And it's, on the one hand, it's a very easy conversation to have because it's so obvious. But it's also a very difficult conversation to have because the kinds of things that, that might change Pakistan's behavior are not things that politicians find easily palatable. And so at the 19th year of this conflict, um, I'm going to submit to you that this war was lost the day the Americans went in. And I've, I've had this view for quite some time, and for better or for worse, my assessments have largely proven robust. And the reason, of course, is the way the Americans saw the region, the Americans were unable to view Iran differently. And from the beginning, we made Pakistan our partner in this conflict. And Pakistan was the one country that was actually dedicated to ensuring that the project in Afghanistan doesn't fail or that it doesn't succeed. And so as I look back at the different ways in which this, was con this conflict was fought, I really struggle to find an outcome in which failure was not purchased on the installment plan, right? The only way it, when I think back where the outcome could have played out differently was if President uh, George W. Bush had had the political temerity to take advantage of the opening with President Khatami in Iran so that we would not have been singularly dependent upon Pakistan for the early facilitation of the war. The other thing that uh, I've been reflecting upon quite a bit of late is that I don't think people appreciate how many wars have been fought in Afghanistan since 9-11. So if you're an American and you've been living in the AFPAC policy theater, you understand that the first war was actually a CIA effort, right? It was a handful of men with a lot of money working with the Northern Alliance. And some of the promises or assurances that were made to Musharraf were not possible given the lack of control that these special operators had over the Northern Alliance. And as this conflict evolved, what the CIA was most interested in was Pakistan's cooperation on Al-Qaeda. And it might be hard to remember because we're now 2019, but well into 2007, every single major Al-Qaeda capture was done with Pakistani cooperation. And so from the CIA's point of view, Pakistan was the perfect asset. But you have to also remember that in 2007, the United States had not declared war on the Taliban, right? That wouldn't happen until 2009. And I remember when I began working with the United Nations in Afghanistan in 2007, again, we can laugh about it today, but at the time, NATO was seriously debating, are we having an insurgency? We now know the answer was yes, right? But by the time we get to 2009, when the United States declares war on the Taliban, we have a new president. And the solution that his generals propose to our losing in Afghanistan because of Pakistan's facilitation of the Taliban is a surge. Now, in terms of the, the numbers of the surge militarily, bringing the troop level up to 140,000 or so, that might not sound like much to you, but there was also a civilian surge, and the military didn't provide security for the civilians. A variety of contractors provided that security for civilians. So what we're really looking at is a geometric expansion beyond 140,000, and all of that logistics had to go through Pakistan. So I argued in 2009 very strenuously against the surge. And my argument was, we can't win in Afghanistan by being more dependent upon Pakistan. So we can, you know, I think as an American, I think we have to do a lot of serious 
asking of questions about how it is that despite expertise in the Beltway, the, administ the various administrations continue to make the same mistakes. And I think the biggest tragedy as the United States pulls out of Afghanistan is all of the money that the United States has sunk into Pakistan to buy cooperation in a war that the Pakistanis were actively undermining. And so I would argue that there's a lot of similarities over the last 18 years, as we saw over the 1980s, when the United States knew that Pakistan was being perfidious, but didn't see any other option. And so we continue to pay money. And the irony is, is that over the last 18 years, me as a taxpayer, we have subsidized the very things that allow Pakistan to coerce us. Right? During the past decade, Pakistan has been very aggressive in its desire to invest in battlefield nuclear weapons while also continuing to invest in its terrorist assets. I'm happy that uh, Dr. Fair has focused on U.S.-Pakistan ties and U.S.-Afghanistan ties because as I saw this subject, I found one country missing a country that perhaps is the most important uh, to the unfolding of events in Afghanistan. Afghanistan has been in turmoil for the last 46 years. Of these 46 years, the Americans have been actively engaged in Afghanistan for 27 years. Therefore, uh, you cannot escape the American presence if you wish to get an appreciation of what is happening in Afghanistan. This is also because there are four principal parties in and over Afghanistan today. These are the Americans, the Pakistanis, the Taliban and the Afghan government. All the rest are peripheral to this conflict. Now, generally, Afghanistan has an infamous title of Graveyard of Empires, but Ashraf Ghanai, when he assumed power, he said, history will not repeat itself. The uh, reconstruction of Afghanistan is an irreversible process. But if we look at uh, the events of last 40 years, what has been the cost of violence in Afghanistan? Nearly 1,11,000 civilians have lost their lives. In about last two decades, 38,000 civilians have lost their lives. Uh, there have been 45,000 army or security personal casualties since 2014. That is at the rate of 45 to 50 every day. And even Americans have lost about 2,000 uh, troops there and more than 20, uh, 24,000, uh, 2400 and more than 20,000 troops have actually been disabled or they have been injured. In terms of financial cost, Americans have invested about 1 trillion US dollars in Afghanistan. But today, they are at the verge of, you know, facing a defeat and leaving Afghanistan. Now the question that arises, you know, that how strong are Taliban and are they really invincible? So I would like to dilate a little bit about who Taliban are. And firstly, I would like to make it very clear that it is not a monolith organization, but there is a larger conglomerate of jihadi outfits which are operating at different levels in Afghanistan. First, what is their ideology? The ideology is actually to create an Islamic emirate of Afghanistan. And they want to have Nizam e Mustafa, which is based on Sharia law. And with this, they talk about creating an expanded Islamic state of Khorasan province, which includes Central Asian Republic, Iran. And in this context, they also talk about waging this holy war even in India, and that is called Ghazwa e Hind. Now, they are not likely to reconcile as far as this basic ideology is concerned. Their strategy is they very clearly say that, well, Americans have the watches and we have the time. They are not in a hurry. 
and they have gained recently some degree of legitimacy because large number of foreign countries are hobnobbing with Taliban which was not happening in the past. How are Taliban organized? They, based, they are based a work on the basis of four shoras and the most important shora there is actually Quetta Shura. And Quetta Shura has two more branches. One is, uh, you know, Peshawar Shura and second is Miransha Shura where Haqqani network, uh, Haqqani network is based. Sirajuddin Haqqani is their leader. And their Amir Mawmanin is uh, uh, Habitullah Akhunzada who is some kind of a jurist and an ideologue. 